In Fargo, we have great gardens this year. And as I was thinking about how to present some information most easily, Zoom came to mind because we've all become quite adept at using Zoom lately. So thank you again for joining me. Uh, I want to make some acknowledgments. Um, some of the slides, actually most of them, were adapted from the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and that's out of the University of Georgia. So if you have additional questions, we have a lot of resources, but they also have a full website with more information. And in fact, I was just on it before this call looking for some information. As Bob mentioned, uh, most of the educational materials that are associated with Field to Fork were made possible through funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we really appreciate your feedback and even let us know what other kinds of topics will be inter you'd be interested in learning about. And then I want to thank my program assistant, Stephanie, for helping create these beautiful slides. So it was really fun to see what she came up with. Now I hope I can do justice in presenting them. So thank you again. So today we are going to talk about some basics of food safety, a little bit of microbiology so you can impress all your friends with your background, and of course, food preservation. On today's webinar, I will be focusing on freezing produce for best quality. And as Bob mentioned, we will be looking at jams and jellies and pickles and salsa in the next couple weeks. So you all know, where the participant list is, I hope. And I'd like you to raise your hand or give me a thumbs up or a yes if you have ever preserved food. Okay, I'm seeing hands going up. And by the way, a copy of the handout that goes with this presentation is available on the Field to Fork website, along with links to the associated publications I'll be talking about. So I see a lot of hands raised, but there are 67 on this call right now, and I should see 67 hands raised because we all preserve food on a daily basis. That was a trick question. Uh, if you have a refrigerator or freezer, you're preserving food. In fact, um, as you heard from my background, I have studied food science for all of my life and I learn more every day. When any of us preserves food, we are really behaving as scientists. And so I'd like to walk through some of the terms to set the stage for what you will learn today as well as in the next couple of weeks. If we, hopefully you will choose to rejoin us to hear more about those other topics. So food safety is interdisciplinary. So it's a combination of biology, chemistry, microbiology, physics, you name it. And what we're trying to do is have safe food all the time, whether it's fresh, whether it's refrigerated, or whether it's canned or otherwise preserved. Food safety is when we take any kind of step that helps reduce or prevent the deterioration of food. None of us wants to, to throw away good food. So this is a step to help avoid food waste, which is a huge issue uh, with one out of three pounds probably discarded in this country. So how do we preserve foods anyway? Well, there's a lot of different methods. And as I said, all of you have preserved foods probably in the last even 24 hours. If you've cooked anything, that is a short-term preservation method. We are going to be talking in this series about longer-term preservation, but thermal treatment means heating, of course, cold temperatures, refrigerators, freezers, and so on. Then we have some higher tech words, osmotic inhibition. This refers to the use of salt or sugar, for example, in making preserved food. So we use sugar in jellies and jams, for example, and that is a, it's part of the whole scientific principle of osmosis. So we're preventing the bacteria from using the water. Uh, chemicals sometimes are used. That can be ascorbic acid or it can be actual chemical pre preservatives. Uh, fermentation is another method. So if you like sauerkraut, that is made possible through fermentation. 
if you like wine, that is made possible through fermentation. And we have these sorts of guides available within our website. So if you're interested in learning how to make sauerkraut or even wine at home, you can learn more on our website about that. Irradiation, we're not gonna learn about that too much today, but if you have spices in your cupboard, most likely they were treated with irradiation to inactivate bacteria and other microbes. And high pressure processing, that includes pressure canning. So that's a method of destroying spores. And I'm gonna be teaching you a lot more about spores and vegetative organisms as we proceed today. And final one on my list is modified atmospheric packaging. So some of our snack foods and even fresh produce are maintained in their safe condition through MAP or modified atmosphere packaging. So that pulls out the oxygen and replaces it with nitrogen or another gas that extends the storage life. So we have lots of different methods of preserving food. But first, let's talk a little bit about food spoilage. This is not a very pleasant picture, is it? Um, we, we don't like to find our food with, covered with mold. So we are gonna talk in the next couple slides about biological, chemical, and physical hazards that can get in our food. And I'll try to draw those back to food preservation. So biological just means living. Bio means life. So biological hazards are associated with live animals, us as humans, and also raw food products. So in this category of hazards, we have bacteria, parasites, viruses, which we're hearing way too much about, but essential to learn more about viruses in today's pandemic, um, different types of fungus, which includes molds and yeast, and also enzymes. So these are all living hazards, so to speak. Um, some bacteria are actually good. So if you like yogurt, that is a very beneficial type of bacteria, a culture that's actually good for our gut health. So biological hazards are the most common cause of foodborne illness, and it's also what we really focus on in food preservation, because we're trying to inactivate these organisms that could, in some cases, produce toxins that could be deadly in some cases. So these are the ones that we in food safety really focus on. Whether we're talking to people about safe grilling or safe cooking temperatures for meat, or whether we're talking about canning food or otherwise preserving it. Chemical hazards are another form of hazard. And um, so we can have naturally occurring or also man-made chemicals. So did you know that allergens are technically a naturally occurring chemical hazard? Toxins are also naturally occurring in many cases. Even that mold that you might see on vegetables or other foods in your refrigerator in some cases could make you very sick. So that's why if you see moldy jam in your refrigerator, unfortunately, I can't tell you to scrape it off and eat it. I mean that there could be a, a bit of a concern for getting sick from that. Um, we also have man-made chemicals, and this is why we wanna handle our pesticides very carefully if we're gardening, for example. Um, so these agricultural or gardening chemicals can be a chemical hazard to us if they're not applied properly. So we have a whole uh, educational program about pesticide safety within extension. We've all heard a lot about cleaning and sanitizing, and if you want to hear more about it, you can watch the, um, the coronavirus food safety presentation that I have archived on our Field to Fork website. I talk quite a bit about cleaning and sanitizing. These are all great. We all wanna have a clean, sanitized space, especially now in the time of a pandemic, but we also wanna apply these safely and according to the directions on the package. So be sure that we're not going overboard with disinfecting and we are using those properly because otherwise they could be a chemical hazard within our food. Um, heavy metals can be a 
chemical that could cause problems, and also some food additives can be considered hazardous in too high amounts. So these are all things to consider. Um, physical hazards. Whenever I ask the question of people, what's the worst thing you could find in your food? And in the chat box, what do you think they tell me? So what, when I pose that question, whether I'm talking to undergraduate students or professionals in the field, what do you think the most common answer has been? Yeah, I see the answer, hair. Everyone thinks that hair is the worst thing they could possibly find in their food. Uh, it's disgusting, granted, but uh, it's not the worst thing you could find in your food because these other biological hazards could actually make you sick or in some cases could, could kill you, basically. So that's what we're trying to avoid today is anyone getting sick because of something they ate. Um, physical hazards include hair or any foreign object. It could be hard or soft. So it could be soft plastic that gets in your food. It could be hard stones. It could be the diamond out of your wedding ring. It, it could be anything that we could see or touch that could get into our food and cause illness or injury, whether that's choking or breaking your teeth. So sometimes um, these physical hazards can be introduced as a result of improper cleaning of the raw materials. So this is why when we bring in food from our garden, we want to be sure and wash it, remove any little stones that might be there, and so on. So those are the main categories of risky items that could be in our food. And I'll ask you again in the chat, what's the worst one? What, which category of bio, biological, physical, and chemical would be the most of concern? Okay, I'm not seeing it yet. <laughs> um, it's a multiple choice question. So which is the worst, biological, chemical, or physical? Biological, yep. And I'm seeing all kinds of interesting answers there. So yeah, I don't wanna see bird poop in my food either, but uh, anything that's a biological risk is what we are most concerned about in food preservation or food safety in general. So good job, thank you for interacting. So we are going to take a closer look at the biological category. These are the most targeted during our food preservation methods. And once you understand all these basic principles, I think everything else makes sense. Um, I do wanna caution you, uh, as you look for information on the internet, on Pinterest, you see it on Facebook, if you're a Facebook follower, um, we can see some very hazardous recipes being shared about food preservation. I was just asked a question, I did a Google search myself, and then I talked to my expert friends across the region, and there were just so many really scary things out on the internet about food preservation that we all agree on, that we, we, we need you to be the ambassadors. If you hear people doing unusual things because they saw it online, it's not necessarily safe. So again, let's take a closer look at this biological category. So this is where the terminology gets a little bit tricky, but I do want you all to be aware of it because it all feeds into the overall topic of food safety and especially food preservation. So we can have three different categories of illnesses. We can have an infection. That means that we've eaten a food that contains live disease-causing microorganisms. So for example, if you eat a piece of raw chicken, you don't grill it long enough, and it's at 140 degrees internal temperature, that is not high enough to kill potentially Campylobacter or Salmonella. So that would be an example of an infection. We also have a category called intoxication. So tox, you see that in there? That means there's a toxin or a poison present, a harmful chemical. If you've ever heard the term botulism, which I bet you have, uh, botulism is an example of an intoxication because 
you are consuming a poison that has formed inside a jar because that jar of food has not been properly treated with heat to kill that organism. And then finally, we have toxin-mediated infection. Now, if you want to really impress your family, you tell them all these terms <laughs> tonight, or maybe not. Uh, this means that you're eating foods that contain harmful microorganisms that contain a toxin that is formed inside of you. So you eat the food, it lands inside of you, and it forms a toxin. And usually E. coli, which you've probably heard of, um, can form something called shiga toxin. And that's why we want everyone to cook their ground beef burgers on their grill to at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, these all play a role and they're all part of safe food. And food safety extends all the way from picking the food to storing it and reserving it if you have leftovers. So I, I really like these little slides because um, I had never seen something that explained this as well as this does. So let's see if I can do this justice. So microorganisms are our greatest concern because they can cause illness. And microorganism, that just means really, really small organisms, living things. So we can have vegetative cells, and they're showing they look like the little mice on the diagram. And then we have the circles with the little organism inside. Those represent spores. So food can have both the vegetative cells or the spore cells. Spores are like little seeds. It's like this organism has a protective coat. Like when we go out in the winter in North Dakota, we have to have a coat on, right? So the spore cells are protected and they will survive even heat. You know, 165 degrees Fahrenheit, you could still have the spores survive. They're probably not gonna make you sick, you know, because they're not inside the right environment to produce their toxin. So unfortunately, if we don't cool food properly, these little inactive spores can come to life. So we shock them by not quite heating them high enough, and then they can produce a toxin, and that could make you very sick. So this is a little diagram again that shows the differences between vegetative cells, which are already alive, and spores, the little protected cells. Spores are what we are worried about in food preservation. And where do we get them? Spores are outside in the soil, all over the place. So that's what we're trying to kill during pressure canning, for example. So if we take a look at this chart, vegetative cells can reproduce while spores cannot. Vegetative cells can grow, they can produce toxin, and they are harmful if eaten. Um, they're not resistant to stress. The only ones that are resistant to stress, like inadequate cooking, are the spore cells. So that's, that's why they are the concern and why we say what we say in food preservation. This is why we have to pressure can vegetables to make them safe. We can freeze them to make them safe, as you'll hear today, but if you're going to put things in a jar and they're low acid foods like vegetables, we have to use a pressure canner. So which kinds of microorganisms are of greatest concern? Well, I'm sure if you're like most of us, sometimes you find fun things in your refrigerator that you don't want to eat. <laughs> uh, molds are among the aerobic microorganisms. Aerobic, as you would guess, means air or in the presence of oxygen. So that's what I'm, the meaning of that term. Um, mold likes a nice moist environment and it will grow between 68 and 95 degrees. So temperatures like we've been having lately, warm temperatures, and also in your house, it's probably 68 to 70 degrees for most of us. So yes, it will grow. And they also, these aerobic molds like a pH and a broad range, two to 8.5.
So it can be a very acidic item, like your jelly or jam is quite acidic, it can still grow mold. And 8.5 is on that basic or alkaline end. So stepping back a bit, pH goes from zero to 14, seven is neutral, uh, less than seven is more acidic, more than seven is more, is more alkaline. So this will grow in a pretty broad range. pH becomes extremely important in canning food. And I will be focusing on that, especially in the next couple weeks. But I just want to introduce that concept. Then we have yeast. And I'm not talking about the kind of yeast that you use to make bread necessarily. I'm talking about the yeast that is typically, can be found, found all around us. Yeast can be in the air, you know, it can be floating all over the place. Um, yeast is also aerobic. It will grow in the presence of air, but it can also survive when there isn't any air. So if anyone has ever had a jar of pickles and it looks really cloudy or, you know, milky <laughs> inside, that means there's probably yeast present. And that's spoiling those pickles. And, you know, it's probably something you don't want to eat. Uh, yeast likes a moist environment. And again, look at the temperature range, 68 to 100. Yep, that's our house and that's outside, so it will grow. And it also likes this pH that goes into that acidic range, remember, below seven up to 6.5, so just under neutral. So it kind of likes things that are acidic. So pickles, loves pickles. And then the ones that we are really concerned about, again, bacteria. Um, yeast and molds are more of a nuisance. We can tell they're there. Bacteria, we can't see them. And they can survive both with air and without air. They do like moisture. And look at the temperature range, 68 to 122. That's a pretty broad temperature range. And they also like this pH of, or acidity level of slightly acidic up to that neutral range. So again, like I said, you're all scientists today because these are important concepts at, that underlie all that we do in food preservation and especially canning. And if any of you are thinking about um, selling a food to the public or um, doing some cottage food type things, these are especially important that you know, you, you know your pH. And if that's something that you're interested in actually having tested, um, we do have a, a lab on campus that does pH testing for a fairly insignificant fee. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I just wanted to point out um, botulism on this chart. If you think back, that's the condition. Botulism is the disease or the illness. And the cause is this toxin that's produced by Clostridium botulinum. And again, that is our most hazardous organism in the world of food preservation. How would you know if you had botulism? Um, fortunately, it doesn't happen too often, but um, it, it can cause big problems. And we have had, certainly heard about outbreaks associated with Clostridium botulinum. It can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, but maybe more notable symptoms would be double vision, um, paralysis, and respiratory failure. So it's, this is why we say, as I said earlier, low acid foods must be pressure canned, unless they're acidified. And canned foods we have to watch out for. Uh, if you ever hear of a, a recall related to canned foods and you have them in your cupboard, you need to get rid of those in a safe manner, bring them back to the store or otherwise dispose of them. Honey can contain botulism, botulinum spores. That's why we shouldn't feed honey to infants under the age of one. And in general, the rule of thumb, if you have home canned, say green beans, which have to be pressure canned, um, best, <laughs> best method is actually to boil those before serving those. And of course, don't give honey to infants for that reason. So if you've had a chance, um, there's 
and take a look at these charts. And the Food and Drug Administration has something called the Bad Bug Book. So if you Google that, if you ever want to learn more about any of these organisms um, and what foods that are associated with them, that's a great place to look. Okay, let's get into some of the basics of food preservation. You've probably all seen these handy dandy jars. These are mason type jars. This is what we recommend. Uh, we recommend the jars with the two piece lids. And we want to always choose the best quality food to preserve. We want to preserve the best, eat the rest is the usual rhyme that we say. Food is not going to get better because we preserve it. So we always want to select the best food and try to can it as say if you decide to freeze food or can it as close as you can to harvest. Then you're going to get your most nutritious, your highest quality food. So I mean, I try to get it in the jars within, you know, a day, <laughs> less if possible. It's going to be safe, but we're talking quality as well. So anyway, again, there's the two-piece lids. I know there are lids that are reusable on the market, and uh, what we say to consumers who ask about that is you can expect more seal failures. Um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation has not done special testing on those reusable lids, and say you can expect more seal failures and so on. Uh, while we're on the topic briefly about lids, one thing I want you to know, because we do get a lot of questions on this topic, is how to prepare the lids. And when you buy the lids, and remember they also have an expiration date, the lids are the flat disc, uh, be sure that you treat those lids according to what it says on the, on the box, on the little package that comes with it. Uh, we do not boil lids anymore like maybe our moms or grandmas or great grandmas might have done many years ago um, back well many years ago now they did change the type of plasticizer and boiling is not recommended so you follow what it says and treat those lids accordingly otherwise i've had people call me because their lids come unsealed and in some cases when they uh the lids actually blew off the, the container, but that was a whole other issue. They hadn't water bath canned those after they made their jelly. So anyway, read the directions. And we have all of, as many things as I could think of to can is available free of charge. You can download any of our publications. And I feel confident that those are safe. They come from uh, USDA and the National Center. Again, um, the parts, we have the metal screw band, the lid I talked about, the sealing compound. Uh, we don't want to use lids that are old and dented and deformed. We also want to check the top of the jar to be sure that there aren't chips. You can keep using jars for a long time, but as soon as they become chipped or otherwise damaged, it's time to use them in making a craft, you know, put some cotton balls in them or whatever you want to do and use them in other ways, as long as they're not going to cut you when you use the, the jar, of course. Um, the other thing to mention, and I see this happen a lot, is that people leave the screw bands on the jars. So technically, when you're done and these are sealed and you hear that pleasant little ping, um, that means, of course, you're going to leave them, you know, leave your jars to cool down 12 to 24 hours. And then when you, before you put them in a cool, dark, dry place, take that screw band off. You can keep using that indefinitely as long as um, that doesn't get dented as well. Uh, the reason we say that is so in case you had an issue and gas was forming, you're not going to pop those, those lids off. So again, some additional pieces about food preservation. Why do we heat if we're doing our thermal process? Uh, heat inactivates enzymes. So for the purpose of today's talk, as we get more into the freezing, um, all fruits and vegetables contain some natural enzymes that if we don't inactivate these enzymes, which are little 
protein molecules that can continue acting and can break down the vegetable um, color, flavor, texture, and storage, uh, we want to blanch them. We want to heat and activate these, these compounds. It won't necessarily make you safe, but if you've ever thrown something in the freezer and maybe combine it with not putting it in the proper wrapping, uh, you might have a product that you really don't want to eat. So you want to do your best in um, following all those rules for assuring that you're going to have the best possible product. So the other thing that happens as we heat is that we're driving air out of the jar. We don't want oxygen. Oxygen is something that is going to cause issues um, during the storage process, and we want this nice seal to be formed in terms of canning. So it holds the lid on the jar, prevents the food from becoming contaminated, and it also prevents air from drying out the food. So as we talk about freezing vegetables, I will be suggesting highly that you push the air out of the um, package, especially if you're using freezer bags. Uh, another form of food preservation, and we do have some information about drying, making fruit leathers, drying vegetables, drying beef jerky. Um, that is a very easy method if you've never preserved food, um, getting a home food dehydrator is not terribly expensive. You also can use your oven, but of course you have to watch out for young kids and pets and so on because you have to have the oven door slightly open with a fan on. But that is another good method uh, to preserve foods and it's also fun. So um, again, if you choose to dry or dehydrate foods, store these in airtight containers and that helps minimize the moisture uptake. You don't want them to get wet again after you've dried them. And uh, another thing that sometimes happens is that people grab any old bag that they have. You know, it might be a bread bag. It might be just a food storage bag. Uh, these sorts of bags are not as thick. They're not designed to properly freeze vegetables and fruits and so on. So always use freezer bags and they will be marked freezer bags. And I know the other bags are less expensive, but you don't want to waste your food. So you want your food to be good quality and look like the food in the picture on the slide. What we're doing is preventing freezer burn. And freezer burn is not a food safety issue. Freezer burn is a quality issue. And this just means that the food is getting dried out and it can take on flavors of anything nearby. So you might not want to eat it. It probably won't hurt you if you do eat it, but who wants to eat something that tastes really bad? Uh, some other items that I want you can, to consider. Uh, when called for in the recipe, the safe formulation that you can get, as I said, from any extension organization across the country or the National Center, uh, use the proper level of sugar or salt. In some cases, I'm always giving you exceptions here, in some cases you can leave out the salt. So if you're pressure canning green beans and you don't want to add salt, that's totally fine. If you're making pickles and you don't want to add salt, that's not fine because the salt is there to help preserve the pickles. And we'll talk more about pickles next week. So um, as I've alluded to earlier, we have two main categories of foods in food preservation. We have those that contain acid. Remember those are, I'll ask you the question. If our foods that contain acid, low pH, or high pH. So if you had an acid food, would it have a low pH or a high pH? Good, good job, you got it. Um, there's some very interesting and somewhat difficult terminology when we get into some of these things that I have to have my brain on straight. Um, 
those that contain little to no acid are called low acid foods. Those that contain acid are acid foods. And again, as I said, pH is the measure of acidity. Um, zero to 14, seven's neutral, and below that is more in the acid range. So here, um, I have some brand new information, actually. There, there are some formerly uh, okay to, to preserve foods that now we're saying we should not. Um, so white peaches, if you happen to see those, we don't have safe methods for those. So it's always important to keep up with the latest guidance. And again, really, I can't emphasize it enough. Don't, don't believe everything you might see on some blogger sites and Pinterest sites. Uh, I could find you any kind of recommendation in the universe, and the only ones that we in Extension can give you are those that are tested. So acid foods are generally all fruits, including jams and jellies. So if you've never canned anything before, jams and jellies are a fun place to start. Um, tomatoes and figs are borderline. So as we'll hear in a couple weeks, a lot more, um, tomatoes have to have added bottled lemon juice or citric acid in the specified amount. Sauerkraut, if you like sauerkraut, that's very acidic. pH is below 4.6. And pickles are certainly acidic. And then we have our low acid, high pH foods. So remember those are opposite of each other. All vegetables, meats, poultry, seafood, soups, most mixtures of acid and low acid foods. And that can be spaghetti sauce, uh, especially if it has meat and vegetables. All of these have to be pressure canned if they're not acidified in some way. So it's certainly possible to take our tomatoes, which are kind of borderline, add the acid that's called for, and process those as directed and have a safe product. You, you could boil green beans in jars for days <laughs> and that won't be enough because we have to reach 240 degrees at least to reach the point where those spores, remember our little bacteria wearing coats? Um, that's the only way we can inactivate those. So again, really important, if you know anyone who's water bath canning green beans or canning them in the oven, we don't ever recommend oven canning, uh, please stop them <laughs> because it could be a very hazardous thing for them, their families, and any friends who get to share what they've made. So really important that we follow these safe guidance. Okay, next question for you. Raise your hand or the... Put a yes if you've ever frozen homegrown food. Okay, I'm seeing lots of you have. Um, if you've never done it, again, jellies and jams, freezing, these are great places to start in home food preservation excellent ways to do it and you can have an excellent end product to enjoy you know next next winter so we're going to start with fruits and then we'll go into vegetables so again it's pretty easy freezing fruit is probably the easiest of all uh, for best quality, we do recommend that you use your frozen fruit within 12 months and also maintain your freezer temperature at zero Fahrenheit or lower. If you don't have, um, if you do not have a freezer thermometer, that would be something I would suggest that you get because it's important that we maintain that low enough because that will maintain the quality of your product. It will stay safe even if it gets you know, 10 degrees or five degrees, but your storage life goes down accordingly. So most fruits can be frozen. Um, quality will vary depending on the kind of fruit, the maturity and the type of pack. So I'll be talking a little bit about the types of pack and this is all included on the handout that is linked with your information that we provided. 
So begin by selecting your best, as I talked about. Um, we want our fruits to be firm. We want them to be flavorful. They're not going to get better because we froze them. So they're going to uh, they're going to be at the level they were when you put them in your packaging. So wash small quantities at a time and avoid brushing and otherwise bruising. And don't let your fruit soak because fruit is already very high in water. It has lots of pores. You don't want it to become waterlogged. So don't put it in a big sink of water, a big you know container of water. It could lose its quality and its flavor, get strange colored, things like that. So there are some things that can happen with fruit. We can have discoloration. Uh, we can have darkening. Yeah, I'm sure you've all eaten an apple and you notice when it sits next to you, it'll start discoloring because of the natural enzymes. Apricots, peaches, nectarines, pears also can darken. So there are ways to prevent darkening. Um, we can certainly use a solution of vitamin C, also called ascorbic acid. We can make lemon juice or citric acid mixtures, dunk them in or we can steam, because what we're trying to do is inactivate enzymes, and um, we also can pack fruits to maintain their quality. And again, this is all information that we've provided in our handouts on extension resource sites. So we can have a syrup pack, an unsweetened pack, a sugar pack, a dry pack, a tray pack, or sugar replacement pack. So I'm gonna talk briefly about each of those. And the other concept I wanna mention and explain what it means, uh, if you're new to canning, you might not be familiar with headspace. Uh, you're gonna see that term used whether you're canning or freezing foods. That just means the space between the top of the food and the top of the container. So that's the head space. And there are different recommendations. In freezing, we leave some space because of course water expands when it, um, when it freezes. So it's gonna take up more space in your container. So leave appropriate amounts. So for example, uh, if we use a liquid pack where the fruit is packed in a juice, syrup, or water, in a pint container with a wide opening, you'd leave a half inch. On the other hand, if you had a narrow top opening, you'd leave three-fourths inch because it doesn't have as much room to expand. So really important to read these directions thoroughly. Again, best quality is what you're looking for. So syrup pack, you might have seen something um, where it talks about 10% syrup, 20%, 50%. Or if you go to the grocery store and you pick up something in heavy syrup or light syrup, this is what they're talking about. And you can do this kind of thing at home as well. So typically we recommend a 40% solution for best quality. I'm not talking as a nutrition specialist right now, I'm talking about a food science and a quality specialist because anytime we add syrup and sugar, we're adding calories, but we're talking quality. So in the case of a 40% syrup, it's two and three fourths cups of white granulated sugar to four cups. And then you get five and a third cups of syrup. And what this does is help maintain the quality and structure of your frozen fruit. And there are other packs as well. But again, this, you don't have to memorize this. This is all on the handouts that we have. Um, there are other ways of packing fruit. We have a pectin pack. Pectin is a type of carbohydrate. Um, we usually use the pectin pack for berries, cherries, peaches. You don't use as much sugar. And you retain a nice fruit flavor, color, and texture. So they all have advantages. Um, we have the unsweetened pack. So if you're really watching how much sugar you're consuming, calories, Basically, you're covering the fruit in water, and that fruit has some vitamin C or ascorbic acid or juice, but unfortunately, this yields a lower quality product than those packed with sugar. The sugar kind of pulls out the juice and helps retain that structure. Um, and then we have the sugar pack, and this is where you sprinkle the sugar over the fruit, and then you mix it until the juice is drawn out and the sugar dissolves. Very simple. It works really well with peaches, 
and um, plums and strawberries and cherries. So very easy to do. Then we could have dry pack. So if you have berries and you want to just put them into a freezer container, push them down a little bit if you want, or leave them whole, seal it and freeze. So pretty simple. I like this next pack. This is really handy and some of you have probably done this. Basically you have a, a tray and you put a single layer of fruit, whether that's strawberries or some other berries, and you put it in your freezer. As soon as it's frozen, you put it into your freezer bags and then you put it back in the freezer right away before they melt. So then you have your individual fruits and you don't have any sugar on them. If you like a little sweetness, you can also use, but you don't want the calories, you can use um, an artificial sweetener like aspartame. Um, doesn't furnish the beneficial effects of the others, and you will see a harder freeze. So it's not going to have the same texture. But these are all methods. You'll just have to decide which one you like and which meets your needs the best. So again, when we're packing, we want to choose containers that are meant for freezer storage, that are moisture proof, um, durable leak proof, and don't ever forget to label what the contents are. You know, <laughs> you may think you're going to remember that you put them in a certain colored container, for example, but you know, most of us aren't going to remember that. So label them with the date. And we want to prevent the loss of moisture and freezer burn. Thawing, best to leave them to thaw in an unopened package. And if you're going to serve these fresh, or not fresh, or you're going to serve them as a dessert, for example, a topping of a shortcake, or you're going to put them in a salad, just let them partially thaw and put them in. Then they'll have a better texture. Because anytime you freeze something, you're, you're going to break those cells and they're going to be kind of flabby and maybe softer than you'd like. Uh, for pies, thaw until the fruit can be separated. Or if you want to do something really fun, you can uh, make say apples, frozen apples, you can mix it all up and freeze the whole chunk in a pie shell, let it freeze, take it out, put it in a freezer bag, and later just put that seasoned chunk into a pie crust and you're ready to go. So that's kind of a fun, fun way to do that and saves time in the long run. So on our uh, website we have this guide and I'm going to quickly go through um, freezing vegetables next. So this is, again, linked by Bob. Thanks, Bob, on, on our Field of Fork site. So let's talk quickly about freezing vegetables. Same kinds of principles apply. Uh, most vegetables will do very well. Unfortunately, some things like cabbage and green onions, lettuce, salad, greens. I saw somebody make a comment about um, zucchini. <laughs> Uh, radishes, cucumbers, potatoes, tomatoes, they don't necessarily freeze well. Uh, they could have use in your menu, but usually more in a cooked dish. For example, tomatoes are fine if you're going to use your frozen tomatoes in spaghetti sauce. Or uh, Potatoes do well if you, for example, made hash browns. Uh, again, same rules apply as for the earlier mentioned containers. Just make sure they're freezer containers, freezer bags, and push out the air, the excess air, in the, in the case of freezer bags. Um, the big difference in between our fruits and our vegetables is that most vegetables require this blanching step. And if you hearken back to me talking about enzymes, remember those little chemical modifiers or those little proteins that are in a lot of, or in us, as well as in our fruits and vegetables, um, we do need to inactivate these natural chemicals because if we don't, our vegetables may discolor, uh, they may toughen, and this also leads to a brighter color. So for example, if you pick up green beans uh, in a can versus frozen, you're going to definitely notice that the frozen green beans have that nice bright green color, whereas the uh, canned green beans have that more olive green color. So 
two different levels of heat treatment cause that change in color. Um, remember that all the blanching time will vary with the size and the type of vegetable. So they all have different times. And we're not going to go through this, but I just um, put this in because this is a chart out of your handout that goes through from A to turnips. Let's see, what do I have? Artichokes to turnips. Uh, how long to blanch. So we count our blanching time, our heat treatment time, from the time the water is boiling after you put the vegetable in. So you want to start with boiling water, put your vegetable in, bring to a boil, and count at the point it reboils. So if you were in corn in the cob season, so I'll just grab one of those. So if you have small ears of corn and you want to blanch them and freeze them, it's seven minutes blanching time. Large ears, 11 minutes. So again, you'll have all this in your hands or online, however you like to read things. So we can do blanching in three different ways. I just described boiling water, with just a basket or a colander or whatever. Um, you can also use steam in the wire basket or in the kettle, or you can use your microwave, but that's not as effective. And these enzymes can live because we can have hot spots when we're cooking in a microwave or blanching in a microwave. So the boiling water or the steam are probably the best methods. Um, once we've cooked these or blanched these for the desired time, then it's really important to cool them fast. And it's going to take about a pound of ice per pound of vegetables. So it's going to be worth your time unless you have a lot of <laughs> ice in your cupboard. You might want to buy a large bag of, of ice to use it. So you take your basket of blanched vegetables, plunge them into a cold pool of ice cold water and then change that water until your vegetables are nice and cool down because we don't want to keep them cooking as otherwise they'll end up with an overcooked texture so we have a couple slides left um, remember if you're using rigid containers that you leave a half inch head space if you're using freezer bags, we're gonna get rid of that air. We don't want freezer burn to happen. So you're gonna press it out. And another little tip for some of you might even like to make freezer meals, but they tend to stack nicer if you, you know, put them in your freezer bag, press out the air, lay them flat and freeze them flat on a tray if you have room in your freezer. And then you can stack them just like a, you know, a deck of cards. So nice and flat will, will store a lot easier than you know, bags of vegetables. That's my tip of the day. So there are different methods of packing vegetables. You can do solid pack, you put them in the freezer containers. You can do the loose pack. So again, similar to what we talked about with tray packing for fruits. So a single, single layer on a tray, I should say tray, not try. Um, and then you place them in a container. Dry pack, after blanching, you pack and freeze immediately, or tray pack. You pack through them quickly. So when you buy those nice vegetables in the grocery store, which I would bet all of you do at some point, I hope you do, we want you to eat vegetables, you'll notice that they are individual, and that's called individual quick frozen. That's the kind that people like because we can pour out as much as we want. So this tray pack is good for making your own IQF or individually quick frozen uh, vegetables so that you could actually use part of your bag and then put, return it to the freezer. So tray pack is pretty handy for that. Um, how to use them? Um, Cook without thawing, except for corn on the cob. It's best to partially thaw before cooking so that it's heated thoroughly, because that's a lot of space, a lot of density. Um, so partially thaw those. Cook until tender uh, to your liking. You can use water or steam or microwave. And uh, microwave is certainly an excellent way for cooking frozen vegetables. And finally, uh, again, we have linked this. Uh, if you ever forget where to find our stuff, just Google NDSU Extension 
food. And I'll take you to our main page and look at food preservation. We are continually adding more things to our field to fork site. And as Bob mentioned at the beginning, we have at least 55 webinars that are archived. So if you want to learn anything you want about you know, butterflies and entomology and pesticides, uh, pressure canning, we have a lot of uh, experts that have donated their time to us to, to provide hour long seminars. So again, um, thank you for your attention and I'm willing to stay on for a while. It's about three o'clock, but I will try to answer any questions that you have. And I hope you'll join us again next week where we'll learn about jams, jellies, and pickles. Thanks so much, Julie. Great presentation. Uh, a reminder before we take a couple of questions that you will be getting an email with the survey uh, on today's presentation. So please go ahead and complete that if you can. Uh, that shall go out in a, in a couple of minutes. So you should see it you know, in the next five or six minutes. I do see a couple of questions here, Julie. Uh, what, here's one about freezing zucchini. Um, the person asking the question is saying that it per turned pretty snotty. <laughs> um, so do you have so do you have any tips on freezing zucchini so it does not turn snotty? <laughs> um, well, that's unfortunately uh, an aspect of zucchini. It's so high in water. That's why it's so low in calories that there's not a good way to get around it. Uh, what I'd suggest is that you drain it thoroughly because you'll get a lot of liquid that'll come out, you know, when, during the freezing process. And then it's it's certainly fine to use that to make zucchini muffins but you want to get rid of all that excess liquid and you know fluid uh, because that will affect your final product so that's about the only thing i have for you on <laughs> thanks julie um and another one on potatoes uh a yeah. lot of potatoes uh that they have and they like to vacuum see vacuum seal them uh do they parboil them or before they freeze or freeze them raw what's the best way to treat potatoes I would actually suggest because of the enzyme activity in potatoes that you partially cook them. And we do have a method on how to do that. So you want to heat them. Um, you might even want to pre-treat them with some anti-browning solution. But yeah, go ahead to our freezing vegetable guide. Um, we have a huge one. Um, we have the one I showed you, but we also have a compendium of freezing information as well. Uh, so definitely, you, if you don't heat treat uh, the potatoes, they will turn brown or even black. And I've had that question several times through the years. So you want to you know, take the best steps. They, they don't do too well with freezing. Um, if you want to make french fries, you're going to get a better product. Or if you want to make pre-cooked hash browns, grate them, or cook them, grate them, and even uh, pat them into the shape. That seems to be a pretty good product in the end. Uh, one more question here. How do we convince people that old recipe books may be dangerous to use for food preservation, whether canning or freezing? That's the million dollar question. So if anyone has... <laughs> As an idea for all of us in Extension, we run into that throughout the country. Um, all my counterparts in Extension always get that. All my grandma always did it. We always did it. I guess um, an analogy I like to say is that you don't get hit by a car every time you walk across the street without looking both ways. But the one time that you do, you know, what could happen? So there's an element of risk. And the thing to remember is that these canning recommendations are updated. And so if you have an old canning book um, back in 1994, so that's already 25 years ago, 26 years ago, they revamped all of the recommendations for home canning. So if you have something older than that, uh, don't use it. You know, if you have grandma's recipe, frame it but it's not necessarily safe. So, you know, the other thing I want you all to be careful of is, of course, I've 
lambasted the, <laughs> the internet, but um, also be careful about some of these new devices that are showing up on TV, even in infomercials, um, where famous chefs are even advising to can in instant pots or in these other devices, and none of that has been sufficiently tested. And a couple of weeks ago, I was on a call with the people who produce ball jars and so on. And, you know, they too are very concerned with all of the you know, proliferation of inaccurate information that's just going out wildly in the public. And I also see canning in ovens and someone even was canning in a bathtub in their backyard believe it or not over an open fire so not in north dakota <laughs> so just letting people know that things change we have to adapt with the changes in technology and science as we all know because of the state we're in right now in the world okay um let's see diane's asking about the handout and that should be on the field the fork website right julie um, just go yep. ahead and feel the fork and click on the big webinars banner at the top and you'll see the handouts there. That's also where the recording of this session will be posted uh, as soon as we have that ready. We'll be sending out an email uh, letting you know that recording is available as well. So I don't see any other questions. So thanks so much for everyone uh, attending today and uh, all your great questions and feedback in the chat. Hope you'll join us uh, next week, next Wednesday for Let's Make Jams, Jellies, and Pickles. And then on August 5th, Let's Preserve Tomatoes and Salsa. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Julie. Great job. Yes, thank you.